Thank you, Teresa. This is the um, Thursday morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee, and I just looked down and realized it's September 3rd. I don't know if I even realized we were in September. Um, time is, is certainly flying by. But we are now streaming live on YouTube, so this is the official start of our committee meeting, and we have a lot on our agenda today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to move uh, first to um, uh, Chip. You have a bill on the uh, that we will be bringing to the floor, and we have Michael Grady here to walk us through those final changes. And um, I know that there was some work last night done on that long piece of language at the end that I think that we've been able to considerably shorten and um, and do what I'm that what our committee was hoping, Mike. That's what I am hoping you're going to present to us. And Chip has been reading for all of our final changes um, and has been getting those to Mike and, and they should be reflected. We also have Susanna Davis. So Susanna, if you wish to weigh in at any point, please just uh, break in and let me know. So let's pop up this language and um, walk through the stimulus equity bill that we have been working on. Thank you, Mike, for your work. You've You're all welcome. So late. Thank you. Can we get that? Do you want me to just walk through changes or do you want a full walk through? Um, I, we have, we've walked, we've walked through this bill probably five times now. So I think the highlights of the changes, but let's highlight the dates and let, we can go through it, but really highlight the, the change. Sure, sure. And I do, I do have a date question for you. Okay. Uh, and I'll, um, page three. So there's no changes on page one, is that correct? No changes on page one or two, or okay. the changes that have been made, you accepted when Thank Becky you. walked through it with you. Thank you. Uh, line six, you'll see that on or before November 15th, the agency of the administration instead of, of the agency of, uh, of human services shall establish the program to award direct relief grant payments to eligible adults and eligible children. You wanted on page three, line 12, to use the past tense that they were ineligible um, to receive an economic impact payment. And then you use the, the lowest income threshold from the CARES Act as your income threshold. Um, the 99,000 is for a single person with no children filing and the 198 is for a joint filing with no children. That is the lowest income threshold uh, in the CARES Act economic impact payment section. It can go up depending on how many children you have, what your income is, and the 5% reduction under that. So I, I, that's a little complicated, but this is the lowest threshold. Should I move on? I think you should. I, we've talked about that section. And okay. let the hand come up. Let's uh, continue. Page three, line 20. You wanted it to be clear that the award is going to be issued as a check by the state of Vermont. So each award issued under the section shall be issued as a direct payment from the state of Vermont. Okay. Any we, questions? We've had, a, we've had a long conversation about the importance of trust building. Okay. So okay. Four, page four. On page four, you have that all applications for a payment under the section shall be submitted on or before March 1, 2021. That's the correct date that okay. we on yesterday. Yes. All right. I'm not going to page hands. four, lines four through seven. You wanted, you changed it from Agency of Human Services to Agency of Administration. You wanted the Agency of Administration to consult with the Executive Director of Racial Equity and the Agency of Human Services. So that change has been made on page four, lines four through five. Page four, line seven, it had previously said as needed. Um, and you wanted that to be struck, may partner with public or private entities as needed to conduct outreach, and you wanted the as needed to be struck. We've discussed all of those pieces, and we okay. see that both of those are put in there, both the uh, AHS and um, the- Executive uh, director. 
Yep, the new exact. Thank you. And now okay, let's you, move to the report. You, you can move to page six. The first report, subdivision G1 on line two, is that report to the joint fiscal at the November meeting regarding how the agency of administration or its contractors will make payments under the program, including how payments will be dispersed to applicants who lack banking services or a mailing address. Moving down, page six, line seven, this is the date issue. Remember that the application deadline is now March 1st, 2021, but you have the report to the General Assembly coming back on April 30th with the summary of payments, any challenges, and a description of the results or success. I just wanted to know if that's really, the all applications may not be in by the time that the report is developed. No, they'll be in by the- They will be in. Well, they, the, well, they, uh, let me, they, they may not be paid out yet. Basically. Yes, yeah. that's okay. As long as they're in, as long okay. as they're in. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, then on section two, this is the appropriation. As the chair referenced, there was a long uh, section amending a previous appropriation from 2018 that has been struck and what is now in is uh, 5 million is available in fiscal year 2021 to the agency of administration for payments under the program of the funds available 2 million shall be appropriated from the general fund and then notwithstanding that 2018 appropriation which was the long section that was amended yesterday Three million of the funds appropriated from the Tobacco Litigation Fund to Judiciary to address adjudication of Chin's cases shall be transferred to the Agency of Administration. Then you see that the agency may use up to fifty thousand dollars of those funds for the administration of the program, and then if the funds available to the Agency of Administration under the section have not been awarded on or before June 30th, 2021, any remaining funds shall revert to the Tobacco Litigation Fund for use by the judiciary in fiscal year 2022 to address adjudication of Chin's cases consistent with that 2018 appropriation. Thank you, Mike. Teresa, could you go back to the bottom of page six, please? Uh, right uh, there. Um, for the administration and payment of grants pursuant to the Coronavirus Relief Assistance Program. Why, yeah. why I, I just need clarification and I'm not following. Why would we mention the CRF if we're not using any of that money in the appropriation piece? Uh, the name of this program is the Coronavirus Relief Assistance Program for immigrants. That's our program. Okay, that's ours yeah. and it has nothing to do with the federal CRF. Thank you. I, I did, didn't read to the end. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the clarification. Chip, Chip did note the very interesting acronym. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> I did not. Uh, um, <laughs> I can change that. I think we need to change that. I, I just think that I, I believe we should change that. Um, yep. Sure. Didn't we have Vermont. Did we have like the Vermont Relief Assistance Program or something? Um, the B trap. Uh, yeah. Just change the, the words relief and swap them. Do you do you need it to say program? It could say coronavirus. Well, program is used throughout. Um, uh, Let's say coronavirus assistance relief program. Maybe not. Um, I want to raise this is Nolan. I got in there. Uh, Nolan? Why, why don't you just get rid of relief? Why don't you just say coronavirus assistance so, program for immigrants? Well, you could also, I, I can't raise my hand. I'm using my iPad. Uh, Nolan, go ahead. So uh, the administration had, uh, and Susanna Davis had kept referring it to as like the uh, uh, coronavirus, oh, what do they call it? Um, the economic stimulus equity payment. So you could call it something like the, you know, coronavirus equity stimulus, or sorry, economic, sorry, coronavirus economic st stimulus equity payment. So it'd be like CREP, 
Why don't we, I, I think we should, uh, can we switch that back out? Say the name of that again, please, Nolan. So you could either, you could call it the Economic Stimulus Equity Payment Program, it'd be like ERAP or ERAP, or you could put the coronavirus in front of it and be like CRAP. Yeah, I oh, really, I really like equity program because I think that's the message that we're driving is equity. And so I really like the equity piece in there. I think it's yes. a title reflecting our, our what we're trying to accomplish here, the equity of this. Yeah, ESIP. Uh, suggestion, economic yeah. stimulus equity from Susanna in the, in the yeah. chat. Uh, didn't see the chat. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, which is what is was basically I was just saying it from her because that was yeah, what that's... you've been calling it. You can call it like yeah. ESA. Okay, okay. So quickly so that we don't end up uh, where we were yesterday with an hour discussion on one date. Uh, let's come up quickly with a name, a title for this program. We can either call it the Economic Stimulus Equity Program or Nolan, you had one more word to put in there. What was you your- You could story? call it the coronavirus equity stimulus, sorry, the coronavirus economic stimulus equity program. So you just add, you could call it the equity stimulus, sorry, economic stimulus equity program, or you could put the coronavirus in front of that too. I would recommend just putting coronavirus in front of it because that is, that is what is, you know, that is the driver of this program, coronavirus economic stimulus equity program. Mark? Yeah. I was just thinking it might be helpful to put the name Vermont in it so that we distinguish this from the federal program and people Please. don't think something else. So we would have- It's our own program. It's not a federal program. I think that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. So how does the committee feel about Vermont Coronavirus Economic Stimulus Equity Program? Oops. There, Nolan wrote it out. <laughs> well, I wrote we, it wrong. From how? Uh, I put uh, economic equity, it should be economic stimulus equity. I'll rewrite okay. it. Okay. I, I, I got it. Vermont Coronavirus Vermont. Economic Stimulus Equity Program. Yes. It sounds like a title made up by a group of people. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> But uh, it accomplishes what our mission is. And so my question is, uh, Mike O'Grady needs to go back now and put this title throughout. First, I want, can we have a full screen, Teresa? If we all agree upon the Vermont Coronavirus Economic Stimulus Equity Program, um, can I see a wave of, uh, a raise of hands, please? Okay, and those opposed, if I could have a verbal no. All right, thank you. And my question is, um, Mike needs to go back and, and fix the title throughout the bill. Are we comfortable taking a vote on this bill and just having the title of it changed? Are committee members good with that? If you are, could I have just a hand up? I'm good. Okay, so my question is now, we have, our, um, we have the bill in front of us with only the title being changed. Are we ready to take a vote on this bill? And, uh, and are there any final questions or concerns for committee members, uh, for Susanna or for a legislative council or joint fiscal? I am not seeing any blue hands. And so I am wondering if uh, a member would like to offer. Madam Chair, I'd, I'd love to make a motion if you're You'd offer the motion. Thank you, Diane. So I, I'd like to make a motion that we report favorably on the uh, House Appropriations Committee bill, the Vermont Coronavirus Economic Stimulus Equity Program. Uh, we have a motion on the floor by Representative Lamford. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. Thank you, Bob. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, is there any final uh, discussion or questions or comments from? <coughs> if not, I would ask that the clerk please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer, yes. Representative Myers. Oh. 
Linda with us. I would like to hold the vote open and see if we can have Linda pop back in for a vote. Uh, please. Representative Townsend? Yes. Representative Yacovoni? Yes. Representative Toll? Uh, yes. And uh, is Linda in the Commerce Committee, uh, Teresa? So she had to. She had. A, she had her very last doctor's appointment today. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we can hold this vote open until noon, um, and then uh, before we close it, um, I, I do uh, know that the speaker is willing to introduce this bill today. And so, if we can put it on introduction today, we can uh, move it more quickly. So we do need to have this bill to the clerk's office. Uh, before the start of the house time, which I believe is at 1.30 today. Two, two o'clock. Two o'clock. So we should have it there by 1.30 at the latest. So Diane. Um, yeah. We so Madam Chair, I'll work with Teresa on getting or, you know, moving the clean copy. And I'm um, assuming that the reporter of this bill is Representative Conquest. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. And Susanna Davis, we want to thank you. Uh, you, you really helped shepherd this bill through and um, as you can see, appropriations doesn't often do a you know a bill with so much policy in it, uh, but with the help of the administration putting this proposal forward, and with the initial help of uh, the agriculture, the the House and Senate Agriculture Committees, uh, we were able to do this in a pretty short period of time. And and really, thank you for your work and your interest and your advocacy for all Vermonters. Tremendous pleasure, and I, I hope that you all recognize how important it is what you've just done. Um, through this action, Vermont is leading in the nation, and that's big, um, and you should all be, be very pleased with that. So thank you all for the hard work. Thank you. And Mike, thank you. I realize you were working crazy hours yesterday, and to tuck this in, we appreciate your always good work. And You're welcome. And and thorough, so uh, thank you. And Nolan, thank you. Uh, for JFO. We, we have such a good team between uh, Legislative Council and JFO to support our work. In oh. the okay, so we are now going to move on because we have a lot to do. Uh, at 1115, we have Betsy Ann Rass coming in. Uh, there's some language that we need to include in the budget uh, regarding the legislature uh, having the ability to work off campus uh, when you come back in January. And so that needs to go in the budget so that that, that capability and planning for spaces can happen. And uh, there's also some other language being worked on that would allow for the capacity of spaces to be used on the um, uh, it, within the capital complex that would be large enough for committees to meet. And so in order to move those pieces forward so you all can come back and do this important work in January, we need to uh, make sure you can work off campus and, uh, and with the complex in other areas that would provide for social distancing and uh, safety and that those areas can get set up with uh, video equipment, you know, um, video equipment. I must be out of the 1970s uh, with, with uh, the correct technology uh, so that your committee's uh, meetings can be heard and recorded and um, accessed by others. Uh, so that is at 11.15. Then we'll take a quick break for lunch and you'll nourish yourselves. And then we're going to fly through uh, a lot of work that we've all been working on um, really, you know, just a tremendous amount of effort from all of you. I would like to quickly go to your report. And in your web report, I just wanna make sure we're clear so that Maria can be moving as quickly as she can, uh, working on um, the final copy of the budget. If you go to web, the web report to B209, uh, Maida, we had left open the state police and um, we, have, uh, we have not taken a position on the mental health clinicians. Is that ready to go, Mary and Maida, the mental health clinicians? Uh, we did receive uh, language from healthcare, uh, proposed language with regard to that to include. I don't know where Mary disappeared to. She's our... 
Okay. She's our mental health We're person. We're going to come back to that when Mary's here. I didn't see that she had left the screen. We're almost 11.15. I have three minutes, so there are a few things that we can uh, tuck away. Uh, Kimberly, can you turn to uh, B317 along with the other uh, members? And there were two pieces of DCF that were left open regarding um, um, uh, family services. Uh, was this a Woodside piece within that family services? Because I don't think we have time to hit Woodside quickly here. Right. I think you meant B318, Kitty. The, uh, are you talking about the language? I have, no, I'm in the numbers. Okay. Uh, anything That's to wooden. do with B317 and B327 gets us into Woodside and they are best considered as a package, those two yep. parts. We're going to hold off on that then because that's a bigger piece. Um, and then the last, the, the remaining pieces all depend on where we end up with, um, with money. Um, and so uh, whatever we decide on our, our final list with money will determine if we close out Forest and Parks, State Board of Education, and, um, and there's one other piece that we're going to have to close out, which has to do with a Criminal Justice Training Council. That's still open? Uh, yes, because we have a little piece of money on the list for it. You're right, 42000 Okay, yeah, uh, criminal justice four thirty five training council, and also there was a small piece for the in commerce uh, recommended uh, uh, funding the fifty thousand for the center for rural studies. All right, so those are all uh, when we make those um, final um, decisions with a, a larger list of money, Kimberly. After we do the eleven fifteen language with. Uh, I think it's Betsy Ann who is joining us now at 1115. Um, we will uh, go back to DCF and close out the, and uh, determine if we should close out the Woodside pieces. Thank you. Betsy Ann, thank you. So I, I mentioned to the committee, there was some language that is going to be needed in order for the legislature to prepare for January, uh, to prepare uh, to be off campus and also to prepare for meeting in other spaces within the capital complex. Are you addressing both pieces of language or just one of them? I am just addressing, hello everybody, Betsy Ann Rouse, Legislative Council. I'm just addressing the um, chambers convening and holding sessions. And then Rebecca Wasserman is uh, addressing a separate issue regarding committee space and state space generally. Okay, so yours will be focused on if we're no if we're not in the state house having the ability to meet outside the state house. Correct. Yes. Perfect. Uh, Teresa, do we have this language we can pop up? Here you go. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I'll just give some background. Um, when it comes to the General Assembly and its chambers holding sessions, there are a few uh, provisions of law that are at play. Um, the first is constitutional. Um, the, each of the chambers has the constitutional authority to regulate its own procedure. Another provision of the Constitution is set forth in Chapter 2, Section 6, which requires the two chambers to agree to adjourn to different places. In addition, we've got statute. There's a provision of law in 2 VSA section 1 that provides that the General Assembly shall hold its sessions at the State House. So we have to keep all of these provisions of law in mind when the General Assembly is considering um, meeting outside the State House next year for the 21-22 biennium with the overall concern being that right now, um, it does not appear that it would be safe for both chambers to be meeting in person with the State House. And so this draft that um, is draft 5.2 would address an alternate location for convening and organizing. And when I say that, I'm meaning day one, getting all the new members there um, where the Secretary of State will convene the House and the Lieutenant Governor will convene the Senate and then thereafter holding sessions generally. So where you meet 
after that, after you get sworn in on your first day. And there's another issue just to be um, aware of is just this really is in regard to the General Assembly regulating its own procedure. Um, so while this uh, language we'll get to it in a second is notwithstanding that 2VSA1 section that says that the sessions of the General Assembly are held at the State House, and this would be in a bill that would be submitted to the governor. The big picture is that this is the General Assembly regulating its own procedure so you can perform your constitutional legislative function. Um, so it's really, this language is designed to get you there on day one, be able to get sworn in as new members and then making clear that you're able to meet outside the state house. So it starts out with some findings and purpose and intent um, with the, in section 1A, providing the findings is that the General Assembly would be finding that both chambers convening, organizing, and holding sessions of the next biennium in person at the State House in Montpelier conflicts with health precautions that are necessary to mitigate the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Subsection B describes that it's the purpose of this act to provide an alternate means of convening, organizing, and holding sessions of the 21-22 biennium in order to protect the public health, safety, and welfare during the pandemic, while also maintaining the ability of the legislative branch to can perform its constitutional legislative duties. And then subsection C is providing uh, the intent. So first, by this act, the General Assembly would be intending to establish in law the alternate means of convening, organizing, and holding session for each chamber next biennium. But we'll see further on in this bill that while this bill would set out the plan A, specify what those locations will be for day one, after we leave here, after you finally adjourn sine DA this biennium, we likely, we hope plan A is going to be workable, but we just won't know for sure. You know, what if something else could happen with the plan A that this bill sets out? And so this bill, um, pursuant to JLMC request, Joint Legislative Management Committee request, sets out a plan B just in case something happens to that plan A location for convening and organizing both chambers. Um, in case that plan A location, if there's a flood or somehow that building um, would also risk public health, this uh, law, this piece of legislation would provide a plan B and it grants that plan B authority to the JLMC um, according to a two-step vote um, to acknowledge the constitutional authority of both chambers to regulate their procedure, but also both chambers to agree to adjourning to a different location. So this language on line six here on page two is saying, however, in acknowledgement that the General Assembly in 2020 cannot know what effects COVID-19 pandemic or other factors may have on the intended alternate of convening and organizing the plan A. After that alternate is enacted into law by this piece of legislation, this act also provides the legislative branch with the flexibility it needs to provide for a subsequent substitute alternate means of convening and organizing the 21 biennium pursuant to the authority this act grants to JLMC and its members from each chamber in order for the legis legislative branch to maintain constitutional control over its legislative procedure. What we're getting at here is that ordinarily to exercise legislative lawmaking authority, you have to do it as a whole branch, both full chambers. Here, the plan B authority would be granted to the JLMC um, but because I view this not so much, really not lawmaking authority, but really regulating your own legislative procedure, which is an issue within your own constitutional control. I just wanna put that in the record. And that's the reason uh, why there is this delegation of authority to a subset of the General Assembly, the, the JLMC, because otherwise the General Assembly can't maintain control of its legislative procedure after you finally adjourn and something happens with the plan A location that this bill specifies. 
Now I'll get to that, what that plan A location is proposed to be in the section two. So it starts out by saying, notwithstanding specifically the provisions of 2VSA section one that require the sessions of the General Assembly to be held in the State House in Montpelier for the 21-22 biennium at the top of page three, the proposal is that the House shall convene and organize, that's the day one, and may thereafter hold sessions at the Barry Auditorium or remotely or both. So that's making clear that um, the proposal is to have the House's plan A be a combination, a potential combination of Barry Auditorium and remote. And it says the Senate shall convene and organize and may thereafter hold sessions in a location or manner that it determines um, because this bill would be starting out in the House. Um, the House, as I understand it, the proposal is to not try to speak for the Senate, allow the Senate to make its own decision about what its plan A authority would be. So the idea would be that once the budget gets to the Senate, the Senate would fill in what its plan A location is and it would fill in what that location or manner is on lines three and four. For example, it could be the same as the house, Barry Auditorium and remote, or maybe somewhere other location. It's for the Senate to decide. Um, and then the language goes on to say, in addition, after convening and organizing the day one activities, getting you there sworn in as members, the chambers may hold sessions as they may by rule, joint rule or resolution provide. Just ensuring, I mean, this is the two chambers at the beginning of the 21 biennium, determining that perhaps, you know, maybe the House wants to move somewhere um, other than the Barry Auditorium or the Senate wants to go somewhere else. So just ensuring that there's that flexibility built in that after day one, um, you could meet and hold sessions elsewhere. On page three, so that was the plan A, the plan A for the House Barry Auditorium, Senate to be determined ensuring that um, thereafter, after day one, you can also do uh, meet in other locations as you agree. But subsection B here on line seven, page three, um, discusses the plan B, just the, the back, uh, the, the potential plan B in case the Barry Auditorium, for example, doesn't work out, something happens with the Barry Auditorium that it's no longer safe to use that for plan A. So this language says, Notwithstanding the provisions of subsection A, if a majority of a chamber's members of JLMC subsequently determines that the alternate means of convening and organizing the chamber on day one, described in A1 or two, will jeopardize the public health, safety, or welfare, a majority of that chamber's members of the JLMC may vote to require that chamber of the 21-22 biennium to instead convene and organize in a substitute location or manner. And if that substitute location or manner is thereafter approved by JLMC, that chamber of the 21-22 biennium shall instead convene and organize in that substitute location or manner. And in this case, JLMC would have to notify as soon as practicable, Secretary of State, Lieutenant Governor and members elect. So it's a two-step process there for that plan B authority, which we hope wouldn't need to be used, but it's a two-step process to acknowledge the constitutional provisions that each chamber should have control over its own procedure, but also that the chambers by chapter two, section six of Vermont constitution have to agree to adjourn to different places. So that's why that two-step process is built in. Um, and that plan B again would only be exercised if there would be a jeopardy to the public in um, having the chamber convene at the plan A location. That is it. Hello. I'm sitting here talking to myself. Sorry. No one told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see my face either both were off i apologize um thank you betsy ann and and so this is uh there's a two-step plan with plan b only needing to go into effect if if plan a um 
if, if there's a, a, a reason why we cannot continue with plan A because of safety, et cetera. Correct. Uh, and this al simply allows the legislature to, um, uh, to meet outside uh, of the state house where uh, Betsy Ann articulately went over um, all of, uh, the, I think there's three places in statute uh, that requires us to, to be at the location of the state house. Dave? A question, Dave? Um, yes, uh, yes. Um, did I read the document right? I don't have it in front of me. Could we just put it back up briefly and go to the top of it, please? Is that is that possible, Teresa? Yep, it just takes yep. a second. There you go, Dave, we'll go to yep, the top. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to get and um, scroll. Oh, slow down. Yeah. If you could go down a little bit. It mentions Barry. I'm going to try to let me tell you my question without citing it on the document because I just can't follow it right now. Um, would it satisfy the constitutional requirements if the joint legislative uh, management committee, we can't go to Barry, we're not going to go to any other alternative we're going to have the first day of the session remotely on Zoom. Would they have the authority to do that? Yes, I read that they do. Um, that Barry Auditorium, thank you, Teresa, that reference is at the top. And then, so that's the plan A for the house. And then if you scroll down to that plan B authority in subsection B, um, it provides that the legis first the chamber has to approve, it says, uh, convene and organize in a substitute location or manner. So that manner was added in there um, to confirm, it's part to co help confirm that it might not be a physical location. It might be meeting remotely, alone, solely. Yep, and as I read this, um, the first day of the convening, the uh, swearing in, et cetera, et cetera, that could be in person at the Barry Auditorium or somewhere else. And then the remainder of the session could be remote via methods like Zoom, et cetera. That is correct. So there's there's sufficient latitude. Yeah, okay. I just, in the Barry thank Auditorium. Thank you, I just wanted oh, to make you. sure. Yes, thanks. Uh, are there any other okay. questions for Betsy Ann? Thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, any other questions? Teresa, can I have a full screen, please, of people? Thank you. Are we ready to uh, take a position on this language? Okay. Uh, Peter has asked that we move it. If there's no other discussion, those of you that support this uh, language to be included in the budget, raise your hand. And those that are opposed, a verbal no, please. Uh, thank you. While we're, so we will include this in our language and Maria, are you on, is Maria on with us? Teresa, you make sure Maria uh, has this language, correct? I, I will make sure she has it, yes. Okay, the next language that I would like to do is uh, the treasurer's language that she talked about yesterday that allows uh, the change to October 30th. It just extends the date and I'd like to move there next. Maida, do you have a question? Oh, well, I did. Um, there was reference made earlier that Becky Wasserman had a piece that was that related to our meetings. Uh, yes, that has to do with legislative space and that's scheduled for this afternoon. Ah, oh, got it. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy Ann. Thank you. Let me go. See ya. Let's go to um, the next piece of language that the treasurer uh, brought forth yesterday and um, she needed an extension. This has happened before. Um, this is, uh, uh, let's see, we're just waiting for it to come up. Hang on just a second. Let me just get it because it's an email. So I had to make sure I had it. And we're we'll looking for that chip is there any other language rever uh, um, referring to the judicial masters that you want to include or was that with the reversion language all good with you? With the bill um, we- I'm trying to remember where, where I have left that. So- um... 
we'll talk. About I need to. I need to check in with um, Maria. I think. Okay, I, I've taken off the reversion language because that's included in the bill. It's just the judicial masters. If you need it, that's on my list still. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Okay, so this is what the treasurer brought forth to us yesterday. It is simply a date change from a September date to an October 30th date uh, for the Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee um, to uh, shall submit to the governor and the General Assembly and the committee's, uh, the committee's estimate of the net state tax supported debt, which prudently may be authorized for the next fiscal year. Um, are there questions for the committee? And if there were, I would hope that you would ask them today of the treasurer. It's simply uh, a date out, which we have before. Are we ready to take a position on this language because we discussed it yesterday? Teresa, can I have a full screen, please? Recommend we approve it. Thank you, Peter. There's a recommendation on the table. If you uh, support it, uh, please raise your hand. And if you're opposed to verbal no, please. Okay, and uh, Teresa, will you make sure that Maria gets that language as well? I will. Uh, another piece of language, if we approve any additional um, money for the grant writer and move it to the base uh, of VHCB, which we'll deal with the money uh, later, I wanna do language now. We have a piece of language that identifies the will of this committee. And we had talked about this I can't remember if it was this week or last week because the days have all blended. Um, Teresa, do you have that language as well? Which one, which one are you talking about? Um, the, uh, the grant writer. Grant writer. Uh, the, the, the money that we we're moving the base into VHCB, it was in uh, emails that we were exchanging today. And you said, um, and, and you mentioned um, that we had put in money, and I said yes, but we'll do the money separately. Oh yeah, but I don't have the language. You don't have the language. I was told it was already in the budget. Is it already in the? Uh, will you just send a, a, a yeah. question to Maria? I'd asked if we needed to have language there. So let's move now to. Um, the joint, uh, the end of uh, session construct, once we leave, if federal money comes in after we leave, we need to have some kind of construct uh, in order to, um, to grant out or, or to move out those federal dollars, unless we want to call the legislature all back in. So the thought is, is that we would get the priorities of the committees of jurisdiction, legislators will be weighing in, and it would guide the Joint Fiscal Committee in directions to uh, send out any additional federal aid that had to be addressed um, uh, while we were away. And so we have, uh, I asked the Joint Fiscal Office to help with some uh, language that would enable the Joint Fiscal Committee to uh, work off the House and Senate priorities and address those that funding if if any federal dollars come in. Do we have that one, Teresa? I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of emails. What did you ask for? <laughs> the end of the construct for the Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, if, if money comes in after we have adjourned. I do not have that. Oh, I thought Steve had that. Maybe, I, I know I've read it. So I thought it went to you as well. Do you have any other language then, Teresa, instead of me asking what you have to do? Um, let me see here. I, can I send you, because some of these I'm not clear. Um, I'm going to send you this one and you tell me whether this one is ready. And then there's one that addresses hey, the, yeah, the housing, the, um, the housing registry from House General. Did you want to? Um, that's CRF, so I want to hold that for CRF. Mary, you have a uh, pay yeah. Okay, I thought we already did that. Is there a change? No. Oh, okay. Uh, we did, but I got. I spoke with. I was in GovOps this morning, and they agreed to the language on a vote of eight to two, and there were no changes. I just wanted to thank you. Close that loop. 
Thank you for that update. Um, does anybody else have any language? Chip, do you have uh, the number of school day language? Nope, haven't gotten that yet. I think most of that language, um, but they're working on some other, one, one other particular issue, um, and I think they're gonna send all the language together, but they didn't expect they would have that till this afternoon. Okay, uh, Maida? Now that Mary's back, I don't know if you want to pose the question again with regard to the mental health clinician language. Yes, Mary, are you ready to bring that forward? No. Sorry. No. When will that be ready? Oh, that. So we have advice from the um, healthcare committee that Maida and I have both seen. I'm just trying to track down and make sure that we've solved the questions of who's responsible for paying for this program in the out years. And there's still kind of a conversation going on about how to make sure this works in the out years. So rather than explaining it to the committee and having that conversation, let me just complete it and get back to you. Okay. So, um, Teresa, if you could ask Steve and Maria, the three pieces that I know are, are out there and are done are the JFC construct for after the legislature leaves is one. Um, the financial reconciliation in A102.1 on the very first page. We just wanted that review to include some sort of um, final technical review or reconciliation. And the other piece that uh, they were working on um, was um, JFC A102.1. And uh, Steve had some, um, oh, CRF, there's some, uh, um, he's also working on other CRF language that has to do with if there's um, any entity that wasn't able to get their CRF dollars out how we can bring those back in and redistribute them when we are out of session. And so that is another piece of, of language. Okay, and then if you could ask them about the grant writer, if grant writer language is needed, I thought we had that. Chip will bring back school days this afternoon and, that, and Mary will bring back the mental health clinicians and we will be at a close with language. Um, I would like to... Um, <coughs> Okay, I'd like to, if you take out your language package, if you turn to page nine, uh, the only thing that's left open on page nine is if we need, um, if we need grant writer language in pa on page nine. On page 17, we had left open uh, for the Capitol Police officer need and that's section E100. And uh, Maida, you've weighed in on the Capitol Police officer need that GovOps is not recommending. No, that would be Diane who has the Capitol Police. Oh, thank you, Diane. Is that accurate? Yep, that's accurate. Yesterday, yesterday we agreed with government ops, or at least I thought we agreed with government ops recommendation and the, uh, the Joint Legislative Management Committee We'll, we'll be looking looking at the both both of those items in the Capitol uh, Police's budget. And um, since we did agree with that, we can close out E100 because that was open uh, for that reason. I, was it? Okay. And, or I still had it open. And then if we turn to page um, 31, Kimberly, this is where the child care provider stabilization grants are. We agreed to the dollars yesterday and the construct, but we didn't go back and address the language. Right, um, thanks, Kitty. Right, so if people look at the bottom of page 31 in language, there are two pieces that travel in tandem. One is E318, which is the stabilization grants, and the other is E318.1, which is the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. And yesterday under the um, web report B318, we closed out uh, the section that dealt with the Child Care Financial Assistance Program year two. That is the language that is captured in E318.1. 
one. So my recommendation that would be to align the language with the numbers that we approved yesterday. And it, you know, it, the explanation is there is that swap out in terms of uh, $2 million of that amount, um, how it's funded. Um, any questions for Kimberly on those two pieces of language? We made the decisions yesterday. This is the language that uh, aligns with those decisions. If you accept those two pieces of language, would you raise your hand? And if you're opposed, if I could have a verbal no, please. Thank you, Kimberly. And the next piece of language that we have left open is on uh, page 33, which has to do with IDAs and has to do with micro businesses. The one piece that needs to be changed on E323 is subject to available appropriations. And if we appropriate, um, then uh, we'll be able to go back and uh, close out 323. And the micro business piece uh, is the same thing, subject to available appropriations. And then it was this waterfall language. Um, and so depending on our actions this afternoon or if we get moving, uh, no, we only have 20 minutes. Uh, this afternoon, we can go back and close out uh, those two pieces with um, IDAs and micro businesses. And that is it for language. So you know the pieces that are hanging out there and there's nothing else that I'm aware of for language that we're going to have to address. Um, and I just want to quickly look through the web report. So uh, we cannot close out the state because we're waiting. Oh, Dave, go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yep. Uh, no, that's okay. Don't be sorry. Um, I guess it goes somewhere else. Let me just see. For instance, I, I received some proposed language um, for house health care on health care disparities. That's Where, CRF, CRF money. Spending? That's CRF. That's going to be a whole Pardon? section. Yep, we're going to move to CRF. Thank you. I don't have to worry about it. Nope. Any CRF. Okay. Thank you, Kitty. All together. Yep. Sorry. So uh, public safety. B okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. 209 is open. Uh, Kimberly, let's move to the Woodside pieces. I think this would be a, a good time to finish up these pieces. In your web report, it's on page 317. Actually, uh, and I'm sorry, three, 327. Right, so uh, the page number for those of us who have the mailed version from Teresa would be at the bottom of page 35. You're gonna see, excuse me, the title, the header for B317, Department of Children and Families, Family Services. The actual numbers though, you have to flip the page and that's where the numbers start on the following page. So page 36, the very, very top of page 36. So the two open sections uh, in the DCF budget are B317 and B327 and both involve Woodside. And they are the last two because there is nothing easy about Woodside. It involves some of our most vulnerable Vermonters and their distressed families, as well as state employees who are working under circumstances that are tremendously demanding. And as we all know, there have been ongoing challenges around how to handle justice involved youth deemed in need of a physically secure location and currently served at Woodside by state employees. And you might recall that there was language, it was in the Q1 and it stated that it's the intent of the General Assembly that Woodside remain open until its closure is authorized by the appropriate committees upon a plan to identify and fund alternative placements and a plan was due from DCF on August 18th. Fast forward and much has occurred, including three destabilizing moves in a short period of time. And in this August 18th report, which we all received, as did some other committees, a plan for interim options are outlined and a more detailed and a longer term proposal has yet to be released. October 1st was the Woodside closure date in the August report that DCF recently submitted. However, there are currently no youth at Woodside and it's the stated position of the DCF commissioner 
that no more youth will be admitted as there are continuing active issues, um, continuing litigation. Fortunately, on this committee and on the Human Services Committee, there are members who also sit on the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, and I've attended when we could attend in person some of these justice oversight meetings where Woodside was discussed. And uh, it's fair to say, I think, that the tension was palpable each and every time. And as we touched upon yesterday, we are budget writers in this committee, but may sometimes find ourselves making policy choices when circumstances demand. And in my view, this is not one of those times given the complex history and the ongoing litigation around Woodside and now the proposed reduction in force that was brought forward yesterday. My preference is that we defer, that we defer to the Policy Committee of Jurisdiction Human Services. Their vote yesterday was to follow and fund the administration's recommendation and to close Woodside by a vote of 10-0-1. And in terms of the, bublet, the budget, as you, the budget implications, were we to do that, it involves two sections that are working in tandem, kind of like the pieces that we looked at yesterday. Those two sections, again, are the B317, the Family Services, and B327 Woodsite. And I want to start with B317. So if I start, uh, I think I'll start with a broad overview and do some non-Woodside details and then some Woodside details. And then finally, that last part, when we get into the Woodside details, I'm happy to report that we have one of Maria's charts that I think will pull this together nicely. So you will see uh, if you're in B317 that there's an increase of about 4 million in federal funds. And this reflects that TANF five-year plan net neutral move that we discussed yesterday. So uh, 3,500,000 went down from the general fund uh, to federal funds. And that was along with the Title IV EF map that's tied to kids who are in FSD custody. That's you know the foster care permanency payments. That's not Woodside. And that allows for a one-time reduction in general funds and an up of about 713,000 in federal funds. Some of those are Woodside pieces, and then there's the familiar 5% internal service fund downs that offset some of these increases. In the global commitment down, you're going to see it's nearly 2 million. And when, I, when I'm using these numbers, I mean the difference between January and where we are now reflects the Woodside residential placement reversions of nearly 3,200,000 because CMS no longer pays for room and board, as well as some of the internal service reductions. And then this is offset by, if you cast your minds back to January, we went through, oh, there were a whole bunch of caseload shifts that we saw in more detail and that, that's essentially a truing up of those. You're gonna see a general fund decrease there of around 5,300,000 and that reflects that 3,500,000 TANF, ISF and some Woodside reversions as well as that one-time Title IV EF map that freed up that 700 plus in general funds. There's also an increase of about 3 million under grants and that goes back to CMSing no use of the global commitment funds for room and board plus there's a barge piece in there and some caseload true-ups. And touching upon a few of the non-Woodside details, and here are, I got these from the ups and downs. If you recall, there was a repurposed position that we saw in January for the Raise the Age Initiative. That remains, that's an up of about 100,000 in personal service in the general funds. And uh, I inquired that, uh, where does that stand? I'm told recruitment is underway. That was maybe a week ago. They were in their second round of interviews. And this is the uh, juvenile justice director of operations position. And there's also an increase of about 117,000 for the balanced and restorative justice or barge contract. And I know both those pieces um, are of interest to folks. You might also recall from January that there was a pilot with the Northwestern Counseling Service Support Services. This is in St. Albans, and that was uh, sought to try to reduce reliance on residential care. 
but that did not produce the hoped for results and that was discontinued. And that accounts for about a down of $640,000 in the Medicaid Global Commitment Funds. And I think that um, this might be a good place, Maria, if you're on to go ahead and put up that chart now. Um, what your <laughs> is Marie? I'm sorry, Teresa. Maria's not is, on. It's just me. And oh, I'm okay. Sorry. I've been working on right. some things, but um, the chart. I remember the chart. Um, I think I here. Know. I can give me a second. There's one that um, is modified that had a. Uh, has two different boxes in it. You want to send me the one that you want up so that we don't get confused. Okay. Like little ladies room. Can yeah, we... I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to. There's, I'm having trouble finding. That. I thought Maria would be here. Let's see. I can ask her. So it's the latest chart on Woodside. It's the so latest we... chart, right? And it has two okay. pieces. There's two different versions, and I want the latest one that shows both boxes. So oh, while Kimberly is waiting to put the chart up on Woodside, so we can uh, address those two areas. Um, I received a text that there may be an issue with the bill that we just passed, and so I'm going to hold it for a bit uh, to have uh, Ledge Council determine if there is a bit of an issue or if it's a, just a disagreement between uh, parties. So uh, we'll just hold that. Uh, we're holding that bill, and um, it may be coming back to us for a revision. Kitty, Kitty? Yes. Please. You mean the equity bill? The equity bill, the one we just passed. Yep. Uh, the language um, uh, to, to make sure that we transfer funds correctly uh, if they've been appropriated, uh, we just have to check that language and uh, the reversion back of them. It has to do with that piece. Um, so not, not within the meat of our bill, not within the construct, but um, we just have to make sure that uh, a couple groups agree that the way we're uh, transferring and reverting back uh, actually can work. So Kimberly, can you tell us what you were going to show us, do you think? Sure, yeah, my apologies. I really thought that um, Maria would have this up. So um, the upshot is actually, one of the helpful places, if uh, I don't know if any of you have that report, but when you go to uh, B327, uh, there are um, various ups and downs that are going to get you to a total of $4,604,412. And that was when the, um, the plan was conceived and that's from the governor's restatement. Then what you'll see when you have the August um, report that came out is that same figure. So the 4,604,412 is reconfigured. That reconfiguration um, has basically four parts. The first part is you'll see an um, one 1,470,029, and that is for continued operations at Woodside for the first quarter 
of this fiscal year. So that's July through September 30th. And that comports with that closure date of October 1. The second you're gonna see, and this is again on our journey to that number of 4.6 million, you're gonna see 1 million and five, $1,526,704. And that is put in as uh, a, an estimate of the cost for various contractual agreements to serve Woodside youth. As we know, there are any number of in-state and out-of-state residential treatment programs for Vermont youth. And there, there is also in that August report an agreement with the Lamoille's County Sheriff's Department for a short-term su secure supervision on weekends or after hours, should that be needed. All of those figures are rolled up into that 1526704. If you keep moving to get to that $4 million figure, you'll also see one-time costs for a new secure location. And this gets to the fact that um, DCF is exploring, trying to put online, it would probably be 12 months from now, a five bed secure, that's physically secure, residential location in Vermont. And the proposals that would be run um, by a private entity. And that uh, accounts for that figure there. You'll also see that there is also a, I'm sorry, a 1.2 million, 1 million 200,000 that is some of the costs that are going into renovations around this new secure location. And then there's also some miscellaneous contract and grants and all of these are captured in getting us to the 4604412 number. So if you, and the box that I was hoping that everyone could look at that would, you would be able to contrast basically captures B327. And what that will show you is, um, adding general funds to maintain operations. And that's a, that's, the, that's a big number. That's a 5 million and plus number. There's an interdepartmental transfer to maintain operations. That's close to 100,000. You'll see there's a removal of a Woodside phase down number. That's a down of 1.2. The operation cost, there's an up of 715. You have an internal service in there. And then there was a mothballing Woodside funds. Those are backed out. Those are close to 250. And that gets you to the four six. So, um, and I, again, apologize that you don't have this in front of you and you're having my less than elegant uh, walk through it. Representative uh, Jesse, Maria just sent us a chart. Is, um, so oh, good. Okay. Second. And I think you've walked through it, Kimberly. So just hit the highlights of it. I don't think you know, I, right. I think followed with, you know. Right. I think the highlight is essentially um, that there are put, there's put in place elements of this plan that are called an interim plan. The fact of the matter is this is essentially the current plan because uh, there will be no more youth. There are no more youth in Woodside. And as I mentioned before, the commissioner has stated that there will not be more youth in Woodside. And so um, these numbers that we are looking at in the top part of the chart are the numbers. Actually, this is the older version, but that's okay. Um, this is the number that we would look at. And it is not different than the numbers that are captured in B317 and 327 put together. Any questions for Kimberly on the Woodside piece? And could you tell us the vote out of the Committee of Jurisdiction again, Kimberly? The vote was 10-0-1. And Kimberly, what is your recommendation? My recommendation is that we accept uh, the recommendation of the Committee on Human Services and that we approve these budgets that align with that decision. Mary? Thank you, I can't raise my hand. I, I accept the recommendation. Um, I understand why it is the way it is. I just want to note that in a more perfect world, we would have the proposal for 
how we move forward with, with managing this population of youth more neatly understood and wrapped up before we moved from one way of doing it to another way of doing it. Um, and so that gives me some pause, but we don't live in a perfect world. And I appreciate that we, we've got to move forward. We can't wait for that perfect world. And I just, we're going to have to pay attention to Woodside a lot going forward or to the population served by Woodside going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments for Kimberly or regarding Woodside? Kimberly has put a proposal on the table to accept the uh, proposal from the House Human Services Committee uh, for the construct to um, close Woodside. And um, as she, our, you did a fine job outlining the issues and, and the flow of money. And I have to tell you, it was an excellent presentation. Um, if there's no other questions or concerns at this time, I would ask those that support um, the recommendation from the Committee of Jurisdiction, please raise your hand. And those of you that oppose a verbal no, please. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. And that closes out um, those two sections, 317 and 327. Thank you. There's only uh, four other pieces open and this will all determine on our work this afternoon, our decision on the 24,000 for the State Board of Education in B5111 and Forest Parks, the 71,000 that is on a list that we're carrying in B705. Uh, B800 uh, had the additional, um, had the 50,000 for the Vermont study for uh, the um, Vermont Rural Studies. And Mary, we're leaving corrections open uh, because we have the out-of-state beds uh, money that's being carried and that's B339. And so uh, what I would like to do is break for lunch and uh, we will come back at, Teresa has us coming back at, um, at 1.15. And at 1.15, when is uh, the next, oh, that's an old agenda. No wonder it wasn't making any sense to me, Teresa. Yeah, I sent you a new one. Yeah, I have it right here. I apologize. So we'll come back at 1.15. And um, there's a couple of things I think that we can get done if there's language. But at 1.30, we're going to hear from the uh, Transportation Committee. At 2 o'clock, we're going to hear from um, we're going to hear from uh, Legislative Council on Legislative Space. My question is to you so that we don't go, we don't come back, um, we don't have to work as late. Are you willing to come back at one o'clock? Because if we came back at one o'clock, um, Maria has, uh, has finalized a list that shows all of our decisions and shows uh, the plus or minus where we are on the bottom line. Are you willing to come back at one o'clock just to have that list in front of you so that we can get that off the table to make decisions after the transportation and after that other piece of language. One o'clock, does that work for everybody? Most often, Peter? I'm in house education at 1230 and will be there until at worst two o'clock. I will get out of there as soon as I can. Okay, we'll get the chart to you, Peter. Thank you. I may be uh, too. Uh, is anybody else, uh, do I have a, Mary, do I have a majority that can come here? <laughs> oh. So one o'clock. Can I see hands for one o'clock? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I make six. Chip's going to be gone. Dave, I can't see you. Uh, Chip, where are you going to be? Uh, I was going to go to House Head 2. Um, I'm not sure it's essential that I'm there. They'll tell me what happens. Um, so if needed, I'll, I'll let you know, Chip. I, I think it's more higher ed than anything else. Um, and so I'll let you know. Yeah, there was going to be some CRF funding discussions. I'll be here, oh, Kitty. That's right. Thank you, Dave. We're good. Mary? I'll, I'll find We're out. I'll probably be able to stay. Okay. Um, Mary? Um, I, I hesitate to say this, but do you want to do the mental health clinician language right now? I've got it okay for it. Or do you want to do that later? I think we need to break. I think we need to break and we'll do it when we come back. Thank you. Thank you. All right, see you all at one o'clock. Thanks.
Thanks. Sounds That's good. Thank going you. Going offline.